Okay, good afternoon and welcome. You know, as Dean of SIPA, it's a real pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to the 2013 annual InvestCore Lecture in International Finance and Business, which was established in 2003 at SIPA to provide a forum for leaders in international finance and business to speak on topics of critical interest to the SIPA community. And our discussion today is also co-sponsored with the Center on Global Economic Governance directed by Professor Jan Svenar. We are really fortunate today to hear from Martin Wolf, Chief Economics Commentator and Associate Editor of the Financial Times. Martin Wolf is one of the world's most respected and knowledgeable economic journalists. His columns in the Financial Times are considered must-read by government and business leaders around the world. He is the author of two important books, Why Globalization Works and Fixing Global Finance. And Martin focuses on economic subjects that are at the core of the economic research and curriculum of this school. He has long been recognized for his exceptional work. He was named a commander of the British Empire in 2000 for his contributions to financial journalism. He has received honorary degrees from a number of university. And as a further recognition of his deep knowledge and judgment, he was appointed one of the five members of the UK's Independent Banking Commission during the 2010 and 2011 period. Uh, which commission was charged with coming up with recommendations on the structural and other reforms of the UK banking system in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. Today, he has given us the intriguing title of his remarks, Saving a Bad Marriage, the Eurozone After the Crisis. Now, this is an extremely important topic. Uh, and if I have understood his provocation, the reason that it is important is that it raises the fundamental question of whether the very structure of European integration uh, is one that can be successful or whether it is irreparably flawed. In other words, is there a realistic path to fix it or will Europe be structurally and economically impaired for an extended period of time? Now, the answer is really a matter of profound global consequence. And indeed, the challenges that are being experienced in other parts of the world, uh, currency issues in emerging markets, slowdown in US growth, are arguably not structural in nature in the way that the European problem may be. So our approach this afternoon is quite simple. After Mr. Wolf speaks, Professor Svenar and I will each ask him a question or two, and then we will open it up to you uh, for your questions. And as an avid fan and reader of your columns, Martin, and as an admirer of the European project, it really is an enormous pleasure to welcome you here today. Please join me in welcoming. Well, this is going to be a frightening experience, I can see from the audience. But uh, never mind, one just keeps going. I, um, this is a very truncated version, inevitably, of what I think, because I've been asked to discuss the topic in half an hour. And this is a pretty big topic, uh, as those of you who have followed it will know. But I will do my very best. It might just go over a little, but I think I can get fairly close to half an hour on the assumption, of course, that this is an exceptionally alert and knowledgeable audience. So I've called it saving a bad marriage. It seems to me a good metaphor for what was created here. Um, this is now, I can't read, I think it's an 18 sided marriage now. I get lost in the number of members, but I think it's 18. Um, and of course, unlike modern marriages, it is, if not irrevocable, it is as near as such as possible because 
the agonies of breaking this up are so great, and we will touch upon that. Uh, touch upon that. So I think what has happened is that many members, not all, but many members have found it far more difficult, painful, uncomfortable than they had expected or hoped. But on the other hand, doing anything drastic like leaving is also unthinkable. So they're really caught. And that's what I mean by being in a bad marriage. I will get to this notion towards the end. Let me just start with my own views. I think it's, it's important to state what one thought and, um, and one's own perspective on this. Uh, I suppose I had a, a, a very moderately British view of this, in that I'm strongly in favor of the European Union. I've always been so. I've always believed it's uh, an important and indeed vital project for Europe. But the single currency terrified me from the beginning. And I started working closely on this subject as soon as I joined the Financial Times in, 2000, in 1987, when already uh, uh, much progress had occurred. There'd been much thinking that goes back all the way to the 70s. If I remember correctly, the Delors Commission had already been put in process by that time. If not, it was a year later. And so I followed this very, very closely. And I uh, was invited in 1991 to conduct a debate with my a very close colleague of mine at that time, who's so long since retired, he was then the foreign editor, in which he would give why the single currency was the greatest thing that had ever happened and would bring Europe together and solve all its problems, and I would express my mild Euroscepticism. And this is the last sentence of that, which tried to articulate why I thought this was a fantastically risky project um, among these very, very different countries with very different economies and very different political and social values. And I, and I remarked that the effort to bind states together in this way may lead instead to a huge increase in frictions among them. And if that were to be the case, if so, the event would mean the classical meet the classical definition of tragedy, hubris, arrogance, arte, folly, nemesis, destruction. From this you will conclude rightly that I spent an unreasonable large proportion of my time studying the classics. Um, one of the many reasons I became a very bad economist and moved on to being a journalist. So just to indicate that this fear was not completely ludicrous, uh, I've taken one of about 10,000 images of, comparable, of a comparable nature from the, from the web. It comes from a Greek newspaper. It's about, uh, I think, two years old, two or three years old. And I don't think I need to explain anyone in the audience what this image is about. And I think it would be fair to say that it does not indicate that harmonious harmony and light are to be seen everywhere in the Eurozone at the moment. So the concern is not unreasonable. And you will, have, of course, all been aware that very recently there's a significant concern. I don't know how big it will become about the rise of uh, fascism in, in Greece under these stresses. And very soon, you'll see why that, me, 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 why that has happened. Uh, I think it's pretty clear why that's happened. So what I'm going to talk about is first, very simply, why I think it's a bad marriage. Secondly, why the worst thing that could possibly have happened to the Eurozone was that the ten, first 10 years were so great. And I have to admit, I'm, I like to be honest, I didn't realize how bad it, this was going to be because it was so great. And then finally, the main part will be about what they have to do now. What are the challenges now? And, and how that interacts how the economic events interact with the policy choices they are being forced to make, both as nations and collectively. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is, seems to me, in essence, terribly simple, uh, though there are, of course, many aspects to it. We, we know a number of very different countries, economies, decided to share a single money. Um, that was the core decision. They did not agree to share any aspect of a fiscal system, nor did they agree to share in any way the banking system. The banking systems remained and remain, actually, to this day, overwhelmingly, it's slightly too simple, but overwhelmingly national. 
um, in this respect, uh, you know, like as if the United States still had predominantly state banking systems. Um, and of course, they didn't go further in fiscal integration or banking integration because they actually really wanted to keep as much sovereignty as possible. They, they were prepared to give up sovereignty on money, which is a remarkable thing, but they, but they really didn't wish to go much further. Interestingly, I think I should stress this very clearly because it's incredibly important. The only people I spoke to at the time, I spent a lot of time talking to very senior policymakers in Europe in the early 1990s and late 1980s. It's the privilege of my job. And the only people I met uh, who were serious inside the Eurozone, who were seriously thinking about the immense problems this was going to cause, were the Germans. I was absolutely clear. They were the only one who really understood what this was going to mean, particularly the economists at the Bundesbank and in the finance ministry, but of course they were all overruled. Um, their hope was, of course, there will be no crisis or, or a more effective union might be agreed once a crisis happened, and that, I suppose, is where we are. And why was this very risky? Well, I put it down in this simple little, little sentence. Pe nobody likes people who mess with their money, and that's what people in the Eurozone think is happening. They think that somebody is messing with their money, and that's gets people very, very emotional. At this stage, in a, more, in a less august audience, I would like to say that for people over about 45, nothing is more important than their money, including the other thing that matters so much before you're 45. <laughs> now, um, so in the first decade, ironically, everything went much better than anybody had really expected. They had what I called the honeymoon. It was an extended and immensely enjoyable honeymoon in which basically everybody got what they wanted. Countries with historically low credibility and high interest rates enjoyed a period of very low interest rates, surging capital inflows, booming economies, spending happily directly or indirectly on their partner's credit. Countries with an historic attachment to export surpluses, Germany, the Netherlands, managed as a result of these huge booms in the periphery to get radical improvements in competitiveness and apparently good investment opportunities for their surplus funds. They were all hugely savings and increasingly saving surplus. But unfortunately, what made everything seem so good was laying the ground for the acute crisis that has existed in the Eurozone now for about four years. And their crisis was essentially part of the global credit crisis, but with special twists, as Merit has noted, because of the structural nature of the system. I think this is a very, very nice chart. At least I hope you will agree. It's very, very simple. It takes the two most important countries. I could have given you similar charts for the other three, but clearly Italy and Spain are overwhelmingly the most important uh, countries. And you see a beautiful symmetry. Back in the mid-1990s, their spreads over on 10-year bonds over bunds were five or six percentage points. Um, that was a period, by the way, in which there was serious concern about Italian default, really serious concern. I remember that very well. And then as uh, um, convergence became credible and the Eurozone uh, seemed a more and more plausible uh, future for all these countries, the spreads collapsed and disappeared completely. So uh, not really short-term interest rates, but crucially quite long-term interest rates all reached essentially the same level. In fact, there was a period when, as you can see, Spanish spreads grew <laughs> by tiny margins negative. So, but essentially the point, I could do the same for all the other countries. In essence, by the mid 2000s to first of the first decade, all credit, sovereign credit risks were seen as the same in the Eurozone. And the same is true for Greece and Ireland and all the rest of it. There was no differentiate whatsoever. And then the crisis hit and you can see there, were two, there was a huge upward spike and we pretty well start, got, went back to where we started. Now, an interesting episode, aspect of this has been the role of the European Central Bank, and I want to stress that in this chart. So you will see that the European Central Bank made two, under Mario Draghi, two very important announcements. The first was a so-called three-year long-term financing operation in which it basically financed 
the commercial banks of the Eurozone if they wanted it for three years. It's a very long central bank operation. And uh, that had a very positive effect on spreads for a while, but it only lasted about four months when the spread started shooting up again because there was such concern about the sovereign side of the spread. And there was this incredibly close link, which I'll come to in a second, between the sovereigns and the banks. So just financing the banks didn't seem good enough. There was this insolvency risk as it was perceived. So then the ECB came along with his so-called outright monetary transactions program, and that's the second spike up, as it shows, when that was announced. And that seems to have been miraculously, indeed unbelievably successful. Um, I would say incomprehensibly successful. It, I regard it so far, and I always say so far, as the greatest confidence trick in the history of monetary policy. But uh, somebody may be able to think of a better one. I can't. But anyway, Mario Draghi managed to persuade the council with one, of course, dissenting vo vo vote, not an unimportant dissenting vote, it should be said, that of Ger the Bundesbank, uh, to make the promise that uh, uh, he would finance governments, if necessary, government bond markets, uh, buy government bonds, on an unlimited but conditional basis. And if you think there's a contradiction in terms there, you are right. <laughs> Clearly, the, and the extraordinary thing which I don't understand is the markets nodded, page, nodded, and, and immediately all the spreads collapsed for all the the country, so there was nothing changing in their fundamentals. The important thing that happened was this announcement, and its effect on the spreads, as you can see, has been very substantial. Though they're still quite high, and real interest rates for Spain and Italy, countries that are not growing at the moment, are very uncomfortable, but they're not absolutely intolerable. Uh, they're in the neighborhood of 3% now. That's just that sort of manageable, while uh, 5 or 6 clearly aren't. This is the same sort of idea I've taken from the IMF's latest World Economic Outlook. I put in the same dates, but it's, it's a weighted average of the sovereign yields. Obviously, Italy and Spain dominate because they are so much the bigger, uh, biggest countries. And it shows, again, this extraordinary correlation between bank CDSs, credit default swaps, and governments, this, this, this uh, death spiral, it's called death embrace that uh, Jens Weidmann actually gave a very important speech on this just a week or so ago on his concern about the continuation of this intimate embrace between bankrupt governments and about to default, uh, bankrupt governments and about to go bankrupt banks. And at least that's his perception. And you can see again the effect of the LTRO and the OMT on this. Now, there, there are innumerable possible charts I could have used for this, and this is not in any way the ideal one, but it's a simple one. Um, during that boom period, which I've described, uh, Germany was in quasi-recession. Recession is perhaps too, too hard, but it was growing very, very slowly. Its, unit lay, its wages did hardly rose. Its unit laid per costs were essentially stagnant. And everybody else had a relatively rapid rises in wages. Um, that's the main reason for this divergence, not productivity divergence. Germany's productivity growth was actually very slow. But you can see there were some huge rises in, uh, in uh, unit labor costs outside, notably so in Ireland. They've collapsed since then. Spain has also had a substantial adjustment. Um, and I will come in a little while, since these are whole economy unit labor costs to what caused that, what caused the adjustment and the nature of the adjustment they've shown. But clearly there was this huge relative cost shift and you can get exactly the same picture if you look at tradable, tradables. But the tradable data are much, don't come out so frequently and they're much older so I've decided not, not to put them here. Now, um, it's pretty clear when you look at the data, it's not perfect, but it's pretty clear when you start looking at the countries in difficulty, which are Italy, Ireland, Spain, Greece, and Portugal, that what they all had in common is that they were large net borrowers. The, the countries that were large net lenders are on the left-hand side. They're basically none of them got into serious difficulty, even if they had quite high debt, like Belgium. Italy is on the margin. It's not a doesn't run a huge current account deficit. But some of these countries, like Spain, Greece, and Portugal, were huge net importers of capital. And by the end of the period, 
2008 had net foreign liabilities of about 100% of GDP, none of which would have been a problem if they'd invested all this money in high return activities which could easily service debt once people ran, but in fact they'd either wasted it in government spending in the case of Greece or in, uh, in case of Greece on Portugal, um, or in uh, Spain and Ireland too, in huge property bubbles which don't do much to service debt unless you manage to sell all the property to your creditors and they have unfortunately been unable to persuade their creditors that that's a good idea. The position on government net debt, which is what of course all the Eurozone discussion has tended to focus upon, which is uh, I would say Germany's obsession in this story, because um, to be quite clear about it, Germany does not want to recognize that the its uh, net creditor position is part of the problem, um, the, is much more complicated and ambiguous. And it's really quite fascinating to see where the countries that got in difficulty fit in terms of the vulnerability of their debt position in the public sector, the fiscal debt, which is the focus of this discussion, in 2007, immediately before the crisis. So we've, we see two of the countries, Greece and Italy, had relatively high net public debt. They were highly indebted. Of those, Italy's debt was nearly all accumulated in the 1980s and early 1990s. Greece was more recent. Um, Portugal is pretty close to France and Germany, so if Portugal had a hugely destabilizing fiscal position, so did France and Germany. And of course, Spain and Ireland had extraordinarily low public debt, in fact, far lower than France or Germany. Neither of them showed any signs of a serious public finance uh, problem. They would have been running large fiscal surplus, in fact, but in both countries, uh, and Ireland's fiscal um, net fiscal debt was only 11% of GDP, so it seemed about as, as, uh, as solvent as possible by all the European rules. Of course, when the crisis hit, there was a huge recessions, huge collapses in government revenue, uh, and rapid rises in spending on unemployment, all the usual things, and net public debt in the crisis hit countries duly exploded. You can see it for Greece, and that it actually takes account of this very large debt write-off, so the Greek position is even worse than is shown here. Portugal, the same thing, it moved from 60% to 120% this year in just uh, six years. Uh, Italy has managed its public finances much more prudently, but its growth is slow, so it's difficult for it to do so, and the, uh, and the denominator is basically collapse, so that pushes it up. Ireland and Spain are, I think, truly remarkable stories in fiscal terms. Um, and I'll just focus on both of them. It, Ireland is, I think, the most remarkable such picture I think I've ever seen. In 2007, net Irish public debt was 11% of GDP, and six years later, it was well over 100%. So the crisis just devastated its public finances. About two-thirds of that is due to the recession, and about a third is due to the need to recapitalize their banks, which was partly due to their own folly and partly because, basically, to put it bluntly, the Eurozone and the European governments told them they had to do that. And Spain is rather like Ireland, but not quite as bad. So let, that's basically an incredibly simple format how we got here, the honeymoon, and how it blew up. Uh, and in my story, obviously, the central part is played by getting all the risk wrong, um, by financing crazy investments on an immense scale in, uh, and crazy spending in the vulnerable countries, financing huge current account deficits, uh, huge expansions in borrowing, which were the counterparts of that, and lending, uh, and um, financing in the process huge divergences in competitiveness, um, which then have to be reversed. Now, what then happened, of course, is that it all stopped uh, very, very suddenly. The capital flows stopped. Uh, the, the borrowers went into crisis. Many of them went bankrupt. The banks got into terrible difficulty because they could no longer borrow and went to the European Central Bank. Uh, for finance. That's why the LTRO was so important. And that's this rolling wave of sudden stops as emerging 
country economists will be familiar with that notion, basically became the core of the problem. And the fiscal position went to hell as a result of these gigantic recessions. And I'm going to come to those in a moment. So how do you resolve a crisis of this kind? Well, broadly speaking, there are three scenarios. Um, well, uh, very brutally, divorce, I break up, bad marriage, uh, or good marriage. And I'll explain what I mean. This Well, the divorce is incredibly costly. I don't have the time, I think, here, because I'm really running over to discuss what would happen if one of the countries were to leave. But I think it's pretty clear that it will be a very painful process in which first you'd have to impose some form of exchange controls and non-convertibility. You would have to introduce a new currency. You would have immense legal problems in deciding what the old legacy debt how the old legacy debt was going to be valued, uh, in what currency it would be. It would depend a great deal on where that debt had been transacted, that, i.e. under domestic law or under some foreign law. In the case of Greece, for example, now a lot of debt has been transacted in London. Nobody knows how the London courts, the British courts, will handle this stuff. Um, it will be a wonderful boondoggle for the lawyers and the vulture capital firms, and that will probably go on for decades. So people don't want to go through this, surprise, surprise. And they also don't want to be outside the European Union, which this is very important, I think, particularly for the countries under pressure, very much including Greece. They want to remain inside this family because the possibility of leaving, they don't know what that would mean. By the way, as a matter of strict European law, if they did leave, technically, they'd have to leave the European Union. Uh, there is no possibility for leaving the eurozone and the euro and remaining in the Euro in the European Union. Well, they probably find some way around this, but it could be incredibly messy. And finally, it is worth stressing that most people think, though we can't be very sure, that it will be absolutely impossible to sterilize a process of departure in one country from its impact on all the others. So there was a tremendous amount of pressure. Uh, from all the other vulnerable countries on, um, well, Greece was the one they were thinking about, that Greece should not leave. And among many other things that had the effect, I think that was in 2012, of changing the German government's mind on this issue, because a number of German high policy makers, including the finance minister, were pretty clearly thinking about forcing Greece to leave, and they changed their mind for these reasons. Now, uh, bad marriage is where we are. It's, that is, I'll come to some of the details of that. So what would a good marriage mean? Well, I think a good marriage can be defined very clearly as a situation in which if you ask countries uh, and the citizens, the majority, whether they think they are really far better off in than they would have been if they'd never joined the first place. No, in the first place, not departing, but they'd never joined, just stayed outside and been like Sweden, say, I think that's what it would mean to be a good marriage. In other words, nobody, everybody stops thinking about the future of the euro. They feel very comfortable with their single currency. It becomes as completely automatic as having the dollar if you're an American. That's a good marriage in outcome. And that's going to take a lot of reform and it's going to take at least a decade and probably longer to do this. And there are four challenges, it seems to me, that have to be met to pull this off. First, there are now some very big legacy debts, both in the private sector and the public sector. And I think it's almost certain, I'm here I'm with Willem Beuter, who's argued this, I think, more cogently than anybody else, that there are going to have to be some more debt write-offs. Um, uh, and some of them will be in very important countries. Uh, uh, if growth doesn't pick up pretty sharply, even in Italy, it's difficult to see how well and how long they're going to manage their 130% uh, debt ratios. Um, Greece, I just cannot see how in market in any market conditions, it can sustain the current debt levels. And the view that they will fall seems to me very much optimistic. That's the first thing. The second thing that was needed, which they have done and has been, a, I think, a pretty well success, is to provide just enough financing to prevent collapse not to prevent massive recessions, huge depression, but to prevent collapse. The ECB, above all, acting as lender of last resort in its very many guises, the IMF and, of course, the Eurozone itself through its uh, uh, now its European, stabi st European stability mechanism for that, the EFSF, have stabilized the financing. The third challenge uh, 
is the adjustment process. And this is the big stuff. Uh, this is the stuff which means a combination of structural reforms of various kinds, divergence, inflation, uh, and productivity improvements, um, which combined with shifts in relative inflation, that's, uh, that's uh, the divergent inflation issue, um, and stronger financial dem final demand in the core so that you've got the Eurozone as a whole growing, finally gets all these countries back to growth, reasonable employment levels, and a financeable external accounts. That's the combination you want. Higher levels of activity, financeable external accounts, comfortably ex financeable external accounts, and uh, much stronger employment. And then finally, you need a whole set of reforms that make the thing work in the long run. That's the agenda. And I would say they've done pretty well on two. They've started on three. They've started on four. Uh, one they don't want to think about. Um, so that's number one, debt write-offs. At the moment, nobody wants to think about it. It's too horrible. But I think it will come back. That depends very much on how well they do on adjustment. If they really do well on that, uh, it might not be necessary. But I'd just like to stress one important point. Part of the adjustment is, of course, falling relative prices. And the more you have falling relative prices, the higher the real value of the debt, which is um, valued in, of course, uh, it denominated in euros. So that's a big problem for them. Um, this is what Irving Fisher in the 1933 called debt deflation. As I said, financing has done pretty well. The ECB, backed by the ASM, has handled that. But there remains the question of how exactly their OMT program would work if it were actually really challenged. Um, there, it isn't impossible, may seem unlikely, but it's not impossible to imagine a situation in which if markets turned decisively against them, the ECB would have to buy a pretty large chunk of Italian debt. And if that were to happen, I'm not saying it will, but it is possible, uh, we are talking about the world's, I think it's probably still the world's third largest debtor in gross terms after the US and Japan, and I really don't think the German public will be very happy about that. Uh, it would create really quite considerable problems. It hasn't happened, let's hope it doesn't. Um, the third issue I said, which I'm gonna focus on the next five minutes, so, uh, five, ten minutes before I get to the end, is this adjustment issue. The adjustment process began, as I've already indicated, once the capital flow stopped and those spreads went through the roof. Um, and the result is current account so deficits were, were cut off very, very quickly. I'm going to show you that in a moment. The result of that was very deep recession, recessions. Um, there began to be, in a few countries, falling relative wages but unfortunately not in the two most important countries, Spain and Italy, where the nominal wages have not fallen at all relative to Germany's. Um, I've already mentioned the falling prices problem, I, but basically the, uh, in the bigger countries there hasn't been any falling prices relative to Germany, or at least very little, very small. Um, uh, Germany is a very difficult comparator to deflate against since it's itself uh, showing absolutely no serious sign of inflation. Um, and of course, a very important issue since there's very little demand in the growth in the core of the Eurozone, I'll come to this too, most of the additional demand they're seeking is in the world. So the Euro's value against the rest of the world's currency is actually a very important issue for these countries. The main adjustment vehicle has turned out to be improving productivity. And countries which have generated improving productivity have improved their competitiveness substantially. This is very true of Spain. But of course, it means much higher unemployment. And uh, as I said, the Eurozone adjustment is very much a shift uh, against the rest of the world. So let me just go through briefly how this adjustment process looks to uh, I tend to just as to, uh, to, to ex elucidate what's going on, to divide the balances, the adjustments in income and expenditure between the private sector, the government sector, and the external sector. So this is what happened to the private sector when the crisis hit. And you can see, as was obvious, that back in 2007, the private sectors of Spain, Greece, Portugal, and Ireland, not Italy, were huge net borrowers. 
absolutely gigantic net borrowers. In Spain, it was about 12% of GDP, Greece about 8%, Portugal about 8%, Ireland about 5%. So they were spending, the private sector in aggregate was spending far more than its income and not unfortunately on productive investment. The crisis hit and there were absolutely giant swings into surplus. The, the shift for Spain amounts to a, a more than 20% of GDP. This is a shift over five, uh, over over uh, six years, and this would be in standard terms. This will be a sort of depression shift in spending by the private sector. Greece is not so extreme, but very large. Portugal is enormous too. Ireland, of course, has this huge private sector surplus in uh, in 2010. This is largely because, for accounting reasons, uh, to do with the the banking bailout. It's a rather peculiar counterpart of their fiscal deficit. I don't think it tells you very much. This is what has happened to fiscal deficits. When the private sector cut back, there were huge rises in fiscal deficits in Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Greece. Ireland, again, I've discussed. And those rises, of course, were, the, were why the fiscal deficits exploded. They, these fiscal deficits peaked in 2010, more or less. Since then, they've been steadily cut back, largely by the famous austerity programs. They've been very big cutbacks, so the fiscal uh, uh, retrenchment has been very substantial uh, in these uh, in these countries. That's it further exacerbated the recessionary pressure, and as a result of the enormous recessions in the private sector, exacerbated more recently by the austerity programs that I've discussed, there has been a truly gigantic swing in the external accounts. Um, um, as a byproduct, these immense recessionary forces, it's modest in Italy, a huge in Ireland and simply incredible in Spain, where the external count has moved by 15% of GDP or will have moved by these forecasts between 2007 and 2016. For a medium to large size country without an exchange rate adjustment, I think that's simply staggering. Um, Portugal is also a huge adjustment and so is Greece. So the external account adjustment in itself has occurred um, but in my view, largely, not entirely, but in substantial measure because of these huge recessions. Now, this has had a very big effect on the Eurozone relationship with the rest of the world. This shows what the current account, or its capital flows, it's the same thing, it's just the other way around, of the Eurozone has looked like since 1998, and it's a forecast from the IMF's most recent work up to 2018. Um, the black line is the Eurozone's aggregate current account balance, which was wobbled around in, in rough balance between 1998 and 2012, very roughly. But, but during the middle of that period, there was this extraordinary divergence with gigantic surpluses in Germany and particularly the Netherlands. That's most of the blue, but it's mostly Germany surplus and huge counterpart deficits elsewhere, predominantly in scale in Spain, which actually became, I think it ended up with the second largest current account deficit in the world immediately before the crisis after the US. Then came the collapse. All these countries have been driven into surplus, and fascinatingly, according to the IMF, by 2018, every single Eurozone member, every single Eurozone member will be a capital exporter. That's a, either in balance or it will be a capital account exporter, and that is in process what I refer to as the Germanization of the Eurozone. It's becoming a giant Germany. It's becoming a giant Germany. And it's fascinating. The result of that is that their current account, the um, balance is shifting from minus 1% of GDP to about 3% of GDP. So it's a swing of 4% of GDP. And if you want to know why the emerging economies are having such trouble with their external accounts, in my view, this is why. The recessions have been, as I said, very extraordinary. And they haven't shown yet despite the adjustments I've shown, any real sign of improvement. This figure is a little distorted by the Greek catastrophe, and I mean catastrophe, um, at least by conventional measures. Greek GDP, according to Greek figures, which I suppose one could question, has, deter has fallen by 25%. And that's a depression, I think, 
by any standards you could possibly imagine, uh, fully commensurate with what happened to the US, I think, in the Great Depression. Um, the other countries have all lost about 10%, between, between 7 and 10%. Uh, the only one of them that shows the slightest bounce at the end of this period, and it's a tiny dead cat bounce, is Portugal. These external adjustments are not driving real adjustment in any significant way. They remain flat and depressed w without yet showing any serious sign of growth. Whether they will in future, I'm sure they will at some point, but with these policies it appears they're not doing so. And of course, not surprisingly, given the story I've told you on productivity as the basis of improved competitiveness and these incredible collapses in the economy, uh, in the economies, which was not what they bargained for, unemployment on the measured data have gone through the roof. So Greece went from 8 to 27 percent between 2007 and the forecast for 2013, Spain from 8 to 27 percent, Portugal from 8 to 17 percent, five. Ireland from 5 to 14 percent, and that excludes a very substantial net immigration, Italy up to 13 percent from 6. Now, I don't insist on the levels. I don't know whether the levels are right, but it doesn't seem to me implausible that the changes are right. Um, so we are talking about countries with, again, depression levels of unemployment, and very little chance that that will fall in the near future to any significant extent. Spain needs growth, given its current productivity of at least 3 or 4% a year to start bringing that down really substantially. One of the most depressing features of this is how badly the gold standard mechanism of the Eurozone works. Obviously, the theory of a fixed exchange rate, uh, which we know from the gold standard, is if you get into a terrible recession, and my God, they have really, really bad recessions with unbelievably high unemployment, is that wages start falling. Well, unfortunately, in Italy and Spain, as I've shown you there, wages have moved absolutely with Germany's. They haven't fallen at all relative to Germany's uh, so far. Germany's is now picking up, so that might now change. But I do. it is noticeable that uh, uh, Greece, with, 20, with its colossal disaster, and now Portugal are showing actual nominal wage falls. Of course, that does exacerbate the debt deflation. So there, the true classical adjustment mechanism can be seen. Um, but the other side of it, as I've said, I wanted to stress, is that a number of countries really have done well on productivity, measured productivity, particularly Spain and Ireland. This is changing whole economy output per employee between 2007 and 12. Spain and Ireland have had massive improvements in productivity uh, Portugal less so, but certainly reasonably well relative to Germany, and that's been a big part of their improvement in competitiveness, particularly for Spain, Ireland. Italy, unfortunately, is a really sad story. It clearly needs a huge rise in productivity. In fact, it's got a fall. Um, and Greece, I just don't understand those figures. I don't know what they mean. But maybe it's the government sector is the only thing that survives. But the, but the, the fall in Greek productivity is really quite remarkable under these pressures. So I've got to the, pretty well to the end. The adjustment process, in other words, has begun. It's incredibly slow and drawn out. The external side has worked best because of this collapse in the economies. There's been some real improvement in productivity in a few countries, very little improvement in relative wages for the big countries, and it's just going to be fantastically long and slow. Uh, in this context of a Eurozone generating no demand growth, the Eurozone as a whole, I did, I fought to put that in because it's important. The Eurozone is the light blue, and you'll see the Eurozone economy as a whole is completely stagnant. So they're adjusting in the context of a stagnant economy, and that's not much help. Um, so they rely on global demand. So finally, we need some pretty big reforms to make this work. I refer to this as becoming a minimum federal union, some sort of banking union, uh, which would be, um, uh, could be done without a fiscal backup if and only if banks could, under all circumstances and in all crises, be resolved without budgetary support. Well, the US hasn't shown that it can do that, so I'm not at, at all convinced the Eurozone could do it. And so the question of whether uh, there will be a fiscal backstop for the banking union is a very big one. At the moment, it's really open, it's not clear. There has to be an adequate safety net for members in dealing with crises. It's, They've lost the number of 
room number of opportunities for flexibility they had when they were sovereign nations, neither the exchange rate nor the central bank is available to do this. You could imagine a number of possibilities. Eurobonds would be much discussed and they're clearly off the table. You could imagine a somewhat bigger European stability mechanism and more European central support. But whether they were really going to create a credible and adequate safety net which would work in crises like this in future is unclear. I personally um, believe that permanent transfers will be a disaster. The last thing they want to do, but there's a real risk of it, and here I'm with the Germans completely, is to turn the whole of the northern Mediterranean into something like the Mezzogiorno. And that could easily happen if the, these transfers began. So it has to be conditional. It has to be temporary. Unfortunately, temporary means 10 or 15 years, which is quite a problem. Uh, at the same time, running the union simply on the basis of rules that everyone will fall automatically, which will uh, avoid all crises in future, which seems to be more or less how the Germans think it will work, is, I think, a, d a delusion and an illusion, and it can't do it without more symmetrical support and adjustment. So let me conclude. This is a really, a really big mess, in my view, rather like as I feared. We don't know yet how it's going to work out, but they have shown extraordinary willingness to experiment. Um, the willingness to act proved substantial uh, once it became obvious that the original design had failed, but the policy throughout has been essentially just enough, almost too late. I think a permanent bad marriage is the most likely outcome. By ba bad, I mean just good enough to live with and not good enough to feel happy about. Divorce remains a possibility until the existing crisis is resolved, and a truly good marriage seems to me at the moment still very, very remote. Um, it, I find this all extremely depressing, and I'm looking forward to you all telling me that I'm far too pessimistic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that astonishing and in intricate and fascinating presentation. I think, uh, as I have here, Jan Svenar, who's one of the world's leading experts on European economy, I will ask a political economy question to get us started. And that's really this. I mean, what, what do you see as the sense of common purpose that could drive this process forward? Is it a sense of the horrors of the past or Europe's place in the world or, you know, the benefits to the people? I'm, I'm trying to sense, you know, that, that what will drive this forward cannot just be a, an agreement among politicians. It has to have popular support in order for these adjustments to occur. So fundamentally, if this is even going to continue as a bad marriage, further adjustments uh, will have to occur, as you're suggesting. And what is the, the political rationale, if you will, or the political economy rationale that will make that possible? Well, that is uh, that's an incredibly good question to which I don't have a good answer. Uh, perhaps I just don't know enough. And, and there will no doubt be people in the room here who come from members of the Eurozone. I'm not from a m member of the Eurozone, very important point, and, uh, and an outsider. And, uh, and though I've got an incredibly large number of things wrong, I always I noticed this debate recently about which pundits get it wrong. I have an incredibly long list of things I got wrong. But one of the things I didn't get wrong, and played in the end quite a big role in, I think, well, a moderate role, was keeping Britain out of this. So, uh, and as I like to say to all Europeans, you cannot, uh, our fellow Europeans, you cannot, you simply cannot begin to be grateful enough for the fact that the British are not in it, um, because we would have blown it up by now. And the, uh, there isn't any doubt about that in my view at all. We would have been out of it. Uh, no, so that doesn't help the answer to tell our view. 
And of course, most of the other countries that are really sort of quite skeptically inclined are out of it. That helps. Sweden's not in. That would have been a nuisance. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and that's important. What is keeping people in this? Well, first, I know this is a list, and in, by the way, we're talking about many different countries with many different histories. But I would say, one, fear of the consequences of failure. Isn't, that is not small, and I've tried to indicate why the fear of the consequences of failure will be, is real and realistic. Second, uh, there remains in many member countries, and I would say including all the countries in crisis, but also many others, a feeling that being part of Europe, I mean political Europe, the integrated Europe, is a, a solution in different ways for long, deep-seated social, political, and economic problems, many, in some cases, centuries long. And one shouldn't underestimate, and one must not underestimate, the power of those feelings. If you talk privately, obviously I don't know infinite number of people, so I tend to talk to the sort of people I would know. But if you talk privately to Italians or Spanish people or Portuguese or Irish, they will all have very, very powerful, deep cultural, political and economic desires to be part of this European thing. Because the alternatives are in various ways being isolated being on their own with one another, often horrible thought, uh, often in very divided countries, countries that have had civil wars, countries that have had uh, vulnerabilities of very kind. This is a very important Central and Eastern Europe, obviously. Finland is another case. So this, this belief that this is their home, however much this doesn't work, is not unimportant. And the final thing, I think that's really very important, even if the economic, and that's without it, indeed I wrote a column two years ago after I'd had a very long discussion with a vast slew of American hedge, of New York hedge fund people, all of whom were convinced it was going to break up the day after once I did this sort of presentation. And I wrote our column saying, you don't understand. This is not going to break up the day after because people want to be in it. And the final thing, and it's absolutely crucial, I'm not so sure about France anymore. I don't really understand France anymore. Somebody can explain. I used to think I understood France. Um, but Germany seems to me very clear. Uh, when many Germans dislike what they've got involved in and they dislike the fact they're going to have to write checks although as I like to say them they've already supplied the money it's just a matter of writing it off uh, but that doesn't go down well because they thought they were lending it to sound and sensible people and they've been disappointed but the, the important point for Germany is think of the alternatives first if the euro were to end Germany could survive very well, but it'd be a hell of a macroeconomic adjustment, which would probably include a wipeout of a goodly chunk of their banking system, and much of their manufacturing would move to their neighbors, because the D -mark, the new DMARC would go through the roof. It would be a nightmare for them. And secondly, so they moan about it, but they, and that's very clear to the industrial and financial sector. And secondly, even bigger, think of the history of Germany. Germany has got in some very profound way what it wants. It's a stable democracy surrounded by stable democracies that may not like it too much, but they're there, they're, they're, they're still talking, they're still negotiating. All its neighbors are linked to it in the most profound way possible. It has the single most important voice in this conglomeration. It's all basically peaceful. Why then should they give it up? Of course they're not going to give it up. So as soon as things get really bad, I've consistently tried to ferment the, uh, the uh, troubled countries to be more difficult to the Germans, because the Germans will give more, I think. But that's another matter. But I think you shouldn't underestimate this. And in the end, that applies to France. So I think breakup is not going to happen. I think they're going to live with this. The question is, what sort of thing they're going to live with? That's the question. Not that the, I don't think it'll, I think it's really quite unlikely to break up. Not inconceivable, but really quite unlikely because the, the, the drive, the, the, the deep drives are, are there. But fine, sorry, it's such a huge thing. I don't think many of the young generation people under 40 or so. They take it for granted in some ways, but they don't feel the particular sort of, it's maybe different in Central and Eastern Europe because the history with the Soviet Union is much more recent. But in the Western Europe, I don't think they feel the, well, we're ending the war. 
I don't think people under 40 in Europe, thank God, actually think going out and fighting wars with one another is something that any sane person would even think about. So that's progress. But they, for the, because, because they don't fear it, it's not a motivation factor, I think. Thank you. All right, well, let me just uh, continue a little bit on this and then ask a question. I, I fully agree with you, and I think that, uh, in a way, uh, many of the young Europeans take the accomplishments for granted. So I don't think they would like the breakup. If they were to imagine what the breakup would mean, they would definitely vote against it, even though in the opinion polls they are very critical of uh, their perception of how bureaucratic Europe is and everything it does. So I think that's, that's, that's important. I think also I would just add to your points of why nobody wants to break the marriage is that it's not clear in the maelstrom that would occur that they would even be able to keep free trade, common market, free labor market, right, Quite and true. everything that's absolutely, there. Absolutely. So it could get much worse. If it went to kind of a reasonable free trade area, complete, you know, integration of financial markets, let's finish that and all that, you know, I think many people would in a way say, well, maybe we'll go for it. But I think deep down there is the worry that you it's mentioned. Chaos. That, yeah, it's exactly, chaos. It's chaos. On every level, you don't know what will yeah, last. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So absolutely. Right, I absolutely right, right, right. agree. So let me ask you a question that occurred to me as you were talking. It's sort of interesting. Uh, remember, 10 years of euro was euphoria, right? There was champagne, and you know, we said, look, 10 years, it's a long time, it lasted, it proves that everything is working well. Now, obviously, you know, with hindsight and all the analysis, we realize it has not. But to what extent have sort of external and quasi-external factors played a part. In other words, uh, the markets um, in some sense overreacted in both directions. You know, take the reaction to creation of Europe and as you showed, the interest rates or the spreads went to close to zero, zero, right? Then they sort of suddenly decide that that's not the right reading of the situation and spreads go way up and then the OMT and suddenly they start going down again. Right? So without major uh, real changes in the real economy on the ground, you have huge uh, so swings in terms of uh, how these countries are treated by an important aspect, namely the financial markets. And, uh, and then, of course, you have the Great Recession, the greatest external hit coming from the U.S. in modern history. And uh, to what extent do you think that these factors actually have created uh, a crisis which is of greater proportions, much greater proportions. In other words, adjustments would have been necessary and so on and so forth, but perhaps they could have been done much more smoothly without creating as much uh, sort of problem, problems, political problems, et cetera, as we see today. Yes, I think that's a, I've had a, we've, I have a running argument with one of my most brilliant colleagues who's a Norwegian economist studied at Harvard. Sorry about that. Um, who, who argues that it's really just a part, and I think he's right, it's a part, an important part of the global credit uh, boom and bust. Right. And uh, so I wrote a piece, I, can't, I think I wrote, uh, yes, I did write a piece some time ago, let's suppose it had been the ERM, you know, the old exchange rate mechanism and not the currency union, there would still almost certainly have been given the adjustments by Germany after unification and what happened in America, there will be floods of capital into uh, dotty places, building houses, you know, I, what's it, how many did Spain build? Huge. Three oh. million or something. They imported four million workers. They, they invested 12% of GDP in turning Spain into the Flor Florida of Europe. Um, so that capital will probably have come in. Ditto elsewhere, as happened to a smaller degree with the UK. Um, there would have been upward pressure on the exchange rates. I don't know whether they would have accommodated that or let them appreciate. The general rule had always been that nothing appreciates against Germany, so that might not have happened. So they would have been very similar sort of processes. The difference only it would have been then that when the crisis hit, Obviously, we would have had an ERM crisis. We all know, know what ERM crises look like. It would have been very, very painful and messy. And after a few um, weeks of resisting, all the pegs would have gone. There would have been large devaluations. Uh, the uh, um, some might have been even been forced into a float. It would have been that extreme. So it would look a bit mm -hmm. like the UK. Yeah. Um, 
the economies would have had recessions, but the exchange rate adjustments would have helped, inflation would have gone up, the inflation would have wiped out a fair amount of the debt, because of domestic... We have, in other words, the way I put it is they've replaced, as an adjustment mechanism, the brutal... I mean, the purpose of the currency union from an economic point of view was to get rid of currency crises. And they were successful. Mm -hmm. They've got rid of currency crises. Very good thing. And unfortunately, they replaced them with credit crises. Mm -hmm. Not such a good thing. And unemployment crises, even worse. Uh, Ireland would have gone down with the pound. Life would be much easier for Ireland if it had gone down with the pound. So I think it would have been a very big mess in any case. No question. Absolutely none. Uh, but its denouement would have been different. Would that have been uh, better? Well, I'm a typical Brit economist. I like adjustable exchange rates. It's a, one of my predilections. I think it would have been better this way. But I know very, very well lots of continental economists would say this is typical British inflationist thinking, and, and it's very good for them to suffer because they're going to be better for it in the long run. And I never really got this view that one must suffer to be better in the long run in economics, and that shows basically a sort of feeble-minded culture. Very good. Maybe I'll just ask one more and then we'll open it up. One thing that's intriguing in your statistics is the fact that um, Germany has increased productivity dramatically. And it also managed, and it's a recent phenomenon, to reduce unemployment dramatically, right? It has high unemployment, over 10%, and it went down. And then you have Spain and Ireland, which increased productivity dramatically. But unemployment has gone up dramatically as well. So no, Germany's productivity actually has fallen. I, th I thought over time, actually, it's gone up. 2007-12, yeah, uh, it's fallen. Actually, German productivity growth has not been very high. It hasn't been terrible, but it's been pretty modest. Uh, a, a, most of its adjustment was actually in, uni in wages. I mean, it's had an amazing wage compression, uh, okay. shifting labor. Its productivity performance up to 2007 was not great, um, uh, but uh, not terrible, but it was pretty modest, percent a year, half percent. But since then, pro German productivity has been consistently falling. It's in good company, by the way. The same is true for the UK and Italy. Um, uh, but that's another subject altogether. All right. Well, thank you very much. Why don't we open it up for questions? And uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, uh, using the mic, would you mind standing to the mic, uh, coming to the mic and asking your oh. questions so everyone can hear you? <coughs> and please identify yourself. God, this is frightening. <laughs> Professor I've been listening Phelps. to uh, Martin's very enjoyable and, and masterful um, analysis. I keep asking myself, well, at the end of the day, what will all these reforms and adjustments, if they take place, accomplish? What will the Europe, what will Europe be like at the end of that? Uh, is there any way that it will get out of the underlying stagnation? Uh, that, that, that I think to an important extent uh, caused the problem. Um, there's a, I've got a quote, this piece of uh, English doggerel that I'm sure Martin knows. Um, it's about a, a, a carriage and a horse and, and the poem begins about the, the wonders of the carriage. And I'll give you that it's got this and I'll give you that it's got that. But then, then the, the poem ends but by saying, but where is the horse? <laughs> uh, I don't see any uh, propulsive movement. I don't see any dynamism in Europe. I just see a very sick economy. And so I, which leads me to wonder whether, any, whether these adjustments and reforms will be possible. Well, I don't disagree. Um, first of all, I wouldn't dare to, but anyway, I, w I don't disagree. The, I think that I I've written a column which I still think more and more is right, that if everything goes well, G Euro, the Eurozone as a whole will become a weaker version in many respects of Germany itself. It will be a bigger but weaker Germany. 
Let me explain what I mean. Germany is a very, I, where I, I think I disagree with Ned, is I think Germany has many very uh, powerful features as an economy. Um, it clearly has, uh, produces a hell of a, an enormous amount of very desirable pro products, which uh, uh, it sells all over the world. Um, they're mostly irreplaceable. I mean, it's very difficult to find competitors. Uh, it can ch they can charge an extraordinary amount. The, uh, the innovation process within these firms is often remarkable. I think we may disagree on that. Um, but Germany is slow growing. It hasn't done, uh, it has obviously very poor demography, as many European countries do, which is an issue. Uh, it uh, hasn't broken out into, in the sort of innovative way it did in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in developing completely new industries. It's building on its old strengths, which are powerful. Uh, it is extremely dependent on, for any, for the demand side on external demand. Um, it's a consistent exporter of capital, most of which is wasted. Uh, it's a sort of chronic and inveterate waster of its external capital, which is what keeps the export machine going. I sometimes do say, why don't you just give it away and have done with it? Because then you'll get, you can keep going the export machine forever. The Eurozone as a whole is becoming like that. Um, if it went well, it'll become stable. Um, the unemployment will be solved. This links with your point. The, the job sharing machine that they created in Germany is quite extraordinary, quite extraordinary. So unemployment might fall. Growth will be slow. Um, dynamism will be limited. Obviously, Portugal and southern Italy are not going to become like Germany quickly. But that's what it would look like. It would look like a big and worse Germany. And I think since Germany is in charge, completely in charge, that's what you'd expect it to become because they can decide what policies people pursue and those are the sorts of policies that people aspire to and they want them to follow. So that's what it would look like if it worked. Uh, and I suppose my answer is if that worked, it would be a great bit, deal better than it is now and not, not what you want. And I think we can safely assume that stability will be chosen over what you call dynamism. And I think if I look back on the policy choices, the sort of meta-policy choices, I'm not talking about the little policy, the meta-policy choices that this incredibly important country has adopted since the war. I th and I think to a substantial degree, it's also true now in the last 20 years of Japan, is they have, these are countries that have absorb the notion completely that stability is the highest goal of policy. And that's what it's about. So they're not interested in your dynamism. In fact, if you came to sell them to them, they wouldn't buy. And, and Germany is in a position to export this culture. And, and by the way, without much resistance, I think in most European countries, uh, it's, not an easy, it's not a difficult sell. They would, they would go for this if they could do it. Now, of course, the fundamental problem is that most other countries lack the strengths that Germany brings to this, particularly the industrial strength. So they are doing it from a weak position, which I think will mean they'll end up with structurally weaker economies. And that seems to me what's happening to Italy. Um, I don't know about Spain. It might north south. It might split north south. I mean, it wouldn't split north south. It'll split in different ways. I haven't discussed the obvious point that one of the questions here is whether some countries will actually survive as countries, and that's certainly a question of of Spain, given uh, the strength of Catalan uh, nationalism. So you're right. That's that's the best on offer. Stability. I would, you know, I'm a European. I'll go for that. It's better than the alternative, which. And the, the reason in the very deep level is I think this is sort of thing, it's way outside my pay grade, about my pay grade, the sort of thing economics journalists shouldn't say. But it seems to me that what happened in the 19th and the first half of 20th centuries was enough dynamism for Europe for a millennium. <laughs> and they don't want any more of this. I may be wrong, but that's what I think the choice is. And don't forget, they're very old countries now, very old countries. Uh, with you know mean ages going up to 50 and dominated by the elderly, you th I mean that really changes the politics. Thank you very much, uh, Carol Brookins. May I? Well, uh, okay, Padma, uh, Professor Desai, and then Carol Brookins.
Maybe we might collect a couple questions. I will be quick if you in don't future. mind. Thank you very much for that illuminating talk, Martin. Um, I think that Germany is beginning to feel, uh, get into labor shortages. Uh, so to a lesser extent, uh, Finland and Netherlands. Uh, my question, uh, would these countries then welcome the Greeks and the Spaniards uh, with 25% unemployment rate? I mean, would you comment on labor mobility across these countries with different languages, different cultural uh, backgrounds uh, as part of the adjustment mechanism? I think the answer to that is very simple. Yes, there seems to be quite a bit of it. The statistics I've seen are very limited. Um, there, there's a, lots of anecdotal stuff about Spanish engineers who've gone to Germany. I don't know the numbers. Uh, there's been a very large outflow from Ireland, for sure. I, I believe there's been a very substantial one from Portugal, but I haven't seen the data. In Ireland, it's clearly several percent of, of labor force. So the answer is yes. Um, the good side of this is part of the adjustment. The bad side is that this is potentially death for the, the exporting countries because they, they, there is a risk, at least in some cases, I think Greece is a good example, that a really quite high proportion of their most talented, enterprising, and well-educated young will depart. Uh, quite a lot of them have ended up in London, by the way. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, it's the sort of adjustment mechanism that dare not speak its name in a way, because it, it raises such profound issues. But it's absolutely clear, also vis-a-vis -vis the Baltics, which I didn't discuss, that um, large, substantial immigration, particularly of young people, is a part of this. Of course, by the way, that will, that will reinforce the long-term fiscal challenges, particularly of the countries with very, very low birth rates in Southern Europe, and most of them have very, very low birth rates. You know, I'm seeing many questions. May I collect a few and invite uh, Carol Brookins? And then uh, Richard Gardner after Carol and Jose Antonio Campo. And then. Um, I wanted to follow up on, on Martin's, on two points that you made. One, the demographic time bomb, because even before the crisis, uh, the very um, uncomfortable demographic outlook was suggesting that there would have to be massive fiscal adjustment, structural adjustment, um, pensions, uncovered pensions were enormous before the crisis, um, militant unions, large public sector unions. So, And then you said also, this would take about 10 years, and then you said, uh, I loved your point about just enough, almost too late, because it seems that we've been lurching back and forth in this kind of mode these last several years. Another 10 years of this is, is a little bit difficult to contemplate. Um, we had 2 to 3 percent growth in Europe at the very best during the boom years. <laughs> um, what is there to expect optimally? And leading from that, what does this mean in the benefit to the United States of signing a free trade agreement with Europe, a limited, really, free trade agreement? Thank you. We're going to collect a few. Ambassador Gardner. Thank you, Martin, for this wonderful talk. You painted a pretty discouraging picture, almost as discouraging as the recent craziness in Washington, on which you commented so acerbically on television last night. Uh, the fourth challenge that you listed to save the marriage involved three things, banking union, fiscal union, and political union, those are pretty grandiose things. And my question is, are the political leaders in the key countries, specifically Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, really prepared to do those things? And if they did, would public opinion in those key countries support them? Professor Ocampo. You're going to get the final word, <laughs> and a long one. OK. Well, thank you, as uh, everyone uh, 
No, I appreciate very much your very uh, uh, enlightened presentation. I, I actually uh, have two entirely different questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, you know, what are the, your expectations of a, if a grand coalition uh, happens to be formed in, in Germany uh, in terms of policies? Is there you know, some, some expectations, for example, uh, that wage, uh, wages will increase faster in Germany and, and support uh, the, uh, the said internal devaluations that the periphery uh, wants and even increase uh, demand uh, through consumption. You know, perhaps less so, but you know, perhaps some fiscal expansion of some sort for uh, certain purposes. I mean, uh, it's in the Grand Coalition aspect, a positive light, let's say. And actually, I, I wanted uh, to ask, it, uh, the, my second question is about the broader marriage uh, of Eurozone and non-Eurozone members of the European Union. Uh, isn't that marriage even w in a worse situation? Uh, that uh, at the end, uh, you know, we're going to see uh, you know sharply uh, division, sharp division in Europe uh, going forward. Uh, at least if the uh, eurozone is going is able to survive. Thank you. And the final question. How many hours? These are huge questions. These are huge <laughs> questions, but you're a master, so you can handle them. Okay. Hi, um, Mr. Wolf and uh, Professor Bob. So nice to see you again here in New York City in Columbia University, SIPA. Um, um, I think in your previous lecture, um, you suggest several solutions for the European debt crisis, the reforms on banking union, fiscal union, and the political union. Do you think it's very hard for the political leader in European unions to reach any political consensus or political agreement? Because the, the 28 national leaders at the EU, EU summit are committed to working hard to keep the euro, euro, euro currency alive. When do you expect um, that the political leaders can reach any concrete breakthrough in near future? And uh, do you think the United Kingdom has any intention to join the single currency in the future. If not, if the UK is going to remain outside the Eurozone forever, um, do you think the status of London as the financial center of Europe could be threatened or replaced by some other European cities like Frankfurt in Germany? And do you think the loose ECB monetary policy will cause the bubble of property price in Europe? Well, do you have such concerns that the boom of real asset uh, market um, will cause some, some, the bubble could burst? Or that the low interest rates of the ECB could, could, um, could cause any bubbles in the property market? Um, thank you, thank you so much. Can I deal with these as best I can in the yeah, few minutes? Absolutely. Um, some of them overlap, fortunately. Um, demography. Um, well, uh, clearly um, many European countries have fairly significant um, demographic problems. One has to distinguish, first of all, they are actually quite different. Uh, um, some countries are, are in a um, very different state. The worst demographic positions in terms of fertility rates are Southern Europe and Germany. Um, France actually has a relatively unproblematic fertility rate, and that's true of most of Scandinavia and actually the UK too. So they are quite different um, in this. But it's clear they're all aging, uh, as I like to insist, particularly in, in gatherings with so many people who make me feel young, uh, which is rarer and rarer these days that we all regard living for a very long time as a very good thing, don't we? So let us not stress too much how painful it is. Um, but clearly, um, the interaction of, of the very weak growth, weak dynamism, um, large demographic changes of the kind we've discussed, in many countries, profound resistance to large-scale immigration, but that varies dramatically across country. Um, the Spanish, for example, have shown themselves extraordinarily willing to take huge numbers of immigrants. Um, 
obviously helped by the fact there are so many, so many Spanish-speaking people around the world, and many of their immigrants, though not all, came from uh, South America. Italy is much more problematic. Um, Germany is in between uh, France, French problems are sui generis. So there's a question of how much immigration can solve it. That's very varied across these countries. Um, but they clearly have an interaction of slow growth, demographic problems, and fiscal problems. The um, countries have tackled these to different degrees. I'm confidently told by every Italian and, in addition, the IMF, that the Italian pension system is completely sound. How they've done this is beyond me, but since it was done by Mario Draghi, who's a very clever man, it must be true. I presume they hope they're all going to drop dead quickly. Uh, but the most important element of the solution on this, on the pension side, is fairly straightforward, and they're all going to retire much later. And there have been very big changes on that, by the way, understated in many cases how big those changes have been. Um, I'm not persuaded that health costs are necessarily a catastrophe, but it depends very much on the interaction of innovation in the health sector and the way it's financed. You in America know more about this than many of the others because you've made such a mess of it. But, the, but the, uh, I'd like to remind people that most of the cost of a healthcare system, an incredibly high proportion, are incurred in the last year or two of people's lives whenever they die. Um, there is a problem, obviously, with care of the old, and that is going to increase in expense. So there are a range of fiscal problems, and um, since this crisis has worsened the baseline so dramatically, that's the key point, that it's worsened the baseline so dramatically, that the fiscal problems are going to be more imminent. And basically, um, whatever you think about fiscal policy in the medium term, short to medium term, in the long run, it's just going to be tightened and tightened and tightened, and there'll be lots of disappointed people. That is uh, uh, inevitable probably everywhere. Um, the, uh, I don't see, uh, unless you're very optimistic about pure recovery potential, and there clearly must be recovery potential in some of these economies, it, I tend to agree, the trend growth in Europe it's very difficult to imagine it's exceeding 2%. It could be well below that. But there might be some recovery potential. I can't, I had a discussion with Merritt before we came down about the transatlantic partnership. Um, I cannot see it being of any worth pursuing. Um, uh, the problem being that I could imagine liberalization programs that would make a big difference to the economies. But the difficulties involved in agreeing to them are really enormous because they would take on basically every vested interest you could imagine in core regulatory areas. And I don't think there's any chance at the moment that Europe could agree to them. I'm not persuaded the US could either, by the way, but we would be even more difficult. So I'm, I'm not sure the tap makes any sense. I may have been a bit more than usually obscure or confused. I didn't wish to suggest, I didn't think I'd said that, that a political union was required to keep this under way. But, if, but I have to say, the reason I avoided using that language is I've never been quite clear what a political union is. And it could mean so many different things. So I tend to focus on more concrete things. It seems to me that a necessary condition of a stable single currency zone and I think that's the lesson I draw from other federations, is that banks operate across the union and in the event of a crisis, there exists an entity that is able to resolve and or back them without bringing the entire system down. And in the US, that's clearly the federal government and its various agencies. Um, the more you think this can be done without direct fiscal contributions, the easier it will be for the Eurozone to do it with what it's already putting in process. It's, it's moving the, the regulatory structure essentially into the Eurozone, attached to the European Central Bank, under the control of the European Central Bank ultimately. It is creating a resolution or trying to create a resolution machinery that goes with this. But of course it doesn't have fiscal powers. And the Germans are clearly very unwilling to transfer any fiscal powers to this.
I tend still to the view which I've developed 20 or 30 years ago that in any first class banking crisis and first class banking crises are as inevitable as weather as storms uh, it is impossible to resolve without government money ultimately in my view and I have an absolutely clear view on this which I developed 20 years banks are always in the modern world part of the state so if there is no this is I know controversial but I, I, I believe this very passionately and I don't think I don't believe for a moment everybody's statement that the next time they'll all be allowed to collapse the first one will and the second one won't so uh, the the this being so I think Europe needs fiscal backing and in, at the moment and you need enough political union to create a serious fiscal backstop and that doesn't exist yet and that links very much to the grand coalition question the grand, there's, there's a very important point, an incredibly important point that is not made often enough, I think, about Germany. And that is its extraordinary political stability in the post-war period, even after unification. And its people's quite astonishing, but at the same time, completely understandable refusal, unique, unique among all large Western countries, including the US, not to elect any crazies. <laughs> and the, the Dutch elect crazies, the French elect crazies, the Italians do, the Brits now do, uh, and I'm afraid you do, but, they, but the Germans don't. They are really not in any significant way into adventuring. Not in a not in a big way. There's plenty of uh, uh, there's plenty of difficulty at the local uh, local level. There's, we know this, but the political system is astonishingly stable. So they 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 the Christian Democrats in the SPD remain the core. The Greens have become a completely conventional party in really all important respects. But the Greens in the SPD are, I think, somewhat more pro-European a little bit, and more willing to consider wild schemes like euro bonds and things like that at least in, when they're not in power so i generally think that if there were a grand coalition the policies of germany would not change in any decisive way but they would probably be even more or more pro-european and less skeptic than they have inclined to be when the cdu csu particularly with the fdp which went a little bit off the reservation in the last few years so i think the grand coalition would under cement my view that the thing is more likely than not to last. There were two questions about the role of the UK in all this. I very carefully avoided discussing this, but I have done a, l many lectures on the subject, and the truth is I haven't a clue. I, I am prepared to make the following points. The, Euro the UK will not join the Eurozone in my lifetime. Uh, what will happen after that? Well, I'm not accountable. Uh, anything, is, anything is possible, never say never. Um, the, Euros, the UK might leave the EU altogether. I can see circumstances in which that would happen. It still seems to me more likely than not that it, I mean, significantly more likely than not that it will not leave, that it will remain inside as another, another miserable marriage, making everybody miserable in the process. Uh, including itself, but it will not actually get up and depart, but I'm not sure. It depends a lot on, on UK politics and Eurozone politics. If the UK left, stayed in the EU but didn't li join the Eurozone, I think most of the activities we now see in London would probably survive. Um, there might be some parts that will be expatriated or repatriated, depending on how you look at it, to to Europe, but the location of financial transactions is quite difficult to define. The really crucial question from our point of view is where most of the people doing the work will be, and I suspect most of them will stay in London. Not all. Um, my favorite joke, I mean, Paris is very problematic because it's run by the French and they really don't like this financial stuff, and Frankfurt's problem with this is it's too small. I mean, the, the total numbers of people working in the city on all this appalling stuff sorry all this wonderful stuff is the population of frankfurt frankfurt isn't big enough if germany wants a serious financial center it should move the whole thing to berlin and i've discussed this with my friends in germany and they think that is 
very wildly dangerous because it would reinforce the centralization of Germany. So I think London will remain where most financial people live because we like this stuff and, uh, and Americans find it much more e easier to come and live in London than anywhere else because it's a country whose language they more or less speak. Um, <laughs> Um, and the schools, were, you know, it's much easier. So there are 100,000 Americans in London, 100,000. And most of them are in this stuff. Um, I mean, that's, what's the population of Frankfurt, 600,000? I mean, there's no way they can take, what? Yeah, I mean, it's not, it can't be done. So basically it's London or Paris and the French really don't like this. So I think it remains London. Um, and the time zones, you can't really move. Um, uh, I think that more or less... Uh, oh, yes, you finally asked about loose ECB monetary policy. Well, um, that's going to be with us for quite a long time. And um, uh, as, in, as here. And uh, um, what are the byproduct effects of ultra-loose monetary policy? Well, as I like to say, they're really trying to create a credit bubble in Germany. They're really trying. Um, and the Germans are really trying not to have the credit bubble in Germany. And one of the most interesting conversations, this is the last thing, it's very interesting actually, because it's a crisis that hasn't yet happened. I had a discussion with, let us say, a very senior official at the Bundesbank on this very topic. And he said, and I hope this means something to you, all of you here, macroprudential policy, a very good idea. It's how we're going to stop that nonsense from happening here. And so, and what I would call the adjustment mechanism, he would call a bubble. So, uh, so uh, I think that it's going to be very interesting to see how the creditor countries, and above all the creditor country, handles it if the EZB persists with these monetary policies for many more years, which I think it, it will, and whatever he thinks, and if the result is to start stoking serious credit pressures in Germany, because they are very concerned about the possibility and they would really like to stop it. Uh, and that gave, raises some very profound questions. If uh, a member state central bank tries hard to stop a, what is obviously part of the adjustment mechanism, it will create a few problems. Um, thank you very much for listening so patiently. <laughs>